Uh, we are uh, the Racial Justice Committee of the League of Women Voters of Amherst and um, the, the ones who are putting this together. And we name this um, wonderful exchange that we have every month with different people, uh, the Judy Brooks uh, Conversations for named after a wonderful resident of our uh, town. Her name is Judy, was, her name is Judy Brooks. And she, we lost her a few years ago, but she was so active in the league. She was a select, a select board person. She um, was an active teacher uh, for 31 years, and she and her husband, Barry, helped to create or uh, to start the first A Better Chance house in Amherst, which still exists today. So we felt that that would be appropriate because she'd be very happy to be part of this. Um, today, we are extremely honored by a former resident of, of recent times, um, of Amherst and and for uh, her agreeing to come even by Zoom, <laughs> um, <laughs> Sita Seti. Did I get it right? I'm I'm working on it. Um, she is currently the City University of New York School of Law Dean and Professor of Law, and she just got involved last year with City and and we lost her because she was uh, very active at uh, Western uh, New England University School of Law as a dean. And she was extremely busy. And despite all that, she worked with our racial justice committee, helping to start it and be very involved in it. Um, she also uh, was the associate dean for faculty development and intellectual life at Western New England um, University School of Law. And she was also uh, her started her, her legal career from law school at as an associate of Davis Polk and Wardall from 1999 to 206. She received her bachelor's at, St at Stanford University and her her Juris Doctorate 1999 in Columbia Law School. And we are so happy to have her join us and. Uh, Talk, let's talk about democracy. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Soda, and ask you to start. Well, great, and and thank you so much, um, Andrea, for that that warm welcome and introduction. And let me um, actually start by just thanking the league in general and the organizers of today's conversation, including those on the task force. As Andrea mentioned, I um, it was a pleasure to serve with you on that task force for a couple of years before. Uh, relocating back to New York um, last year. And my special thanks to Marcy Sklove, who extended the invitation for me to uh, join today and, and speak. Um, it's really an honor to be part of the Judy Brooks conversation series for the reasons that Andrea mentioned. Uh, Judy was such a force in Amherst on so many levels, and um, it's it's really an honor to be part of this this conversation series. Um, I will also say that the League in general has a very special place in my heart. I served as a board member for several years and count many members um, uh, as friends and folks that I see here today. Uh, you know, it's, it's terrific. Uh, it, what a wonderful group of like-minded folks who want to think about the ways that we can work together towards greater participation in uh, conversations about governance and citizenship and actually effectuate some of the things that we talk about through, through action and through working in our communities. Um, and more broadly, I think that this conversation focuses on something that goes to the heart of what the League of Women Voters is all about. Uh, it's steadfast commitment to democratic values and norms, uh, as well as the right and even the obligation to be an uh -huh. active voice in one's community and one's democracy, whether that's through voting or organizing or other means. And that's really what I'm focusing my conversation about today. And uh, the League has been doing this for over a century and doing it really well. And so it's really a pleasure to be part of this uh, conversation. So today I wanna to focus on a few themes and I deliberately have kept my prepared uh, conversation relatively short because what I hope we're, we'll do is have exactly what this is named, a conversation series uh, with good uh, uh, questions and, and uh, you know, uh, questions and answers with conversation that we can have together. So um, a few things I wanna talk about. Uh, some contemporary examples uh, of the fragility that we see in US democracy. 
Uh, second, uh, contextualizing those examples uh, in US history and also thinking a little bit about contemporary global politics and how we can place um, what we see in the United States in a different context. And then third, what we should be thinking about as the role of an engaged citizenry given recent developments in the United States and abroad, and perhaps this feeling that we are facing headwinds in some aspects of how our democracy is functioning. So, you know, I think a lot has been written in the last maybe uh, particularly seven years, but even in the last maybe six months about uh, the fragility of our democracy. And I wanna think about uh, what we mean by the values of our democracy or the norms of our democracy to, that, that we see fragility in, right? Um, so when we think about successful liberal democracies, uh, it, the United States and ones around the world, these depend on at least a few key things, right? First is this idea of a limited government, uh, meaning that uh, there are clear articulated limits on what government can do and how each branch of government can act and that it carves out the right of um, individuals to be free from government interference in some aspects of their life, right? And we can view that in a lot of different ways, but certainly this is the basis for thinking about what human and civil rights um, mean in terms of um, uh, government oppression and limits on that. The second is transparency in government, um, that we need to let a citizenry or anyone who lives within a nation understand what the government is doing in order to um, be able to make choices about who is representing us in government. The third is accountability of government, that we need to have the process of voting, the processes to change governments, to transition governments, even processes like impeachment, in order to um, show different mechanisms of accountability over the people that we elect to do their work, um, and then finally, uh, you know, I think most scholars look at, uh, you know, a kind of richer uh, definition of democracy is, as also including the idea that all people need to be treated with some level of equality, right? Not necessarily equal treatment for everyone. Every society makes different judgments, like, uh, you know, people under the age of 18 have fewer rights than people over the age of 18 in our society, but in general, thinking about equitable treatment of people. Um, so if we think about the last year and a half, there have been any number of examples that suggest that these norms, these kind of values of our democracy are under some stress um, and that there's some fraying, right? We can see some very public of examples of this. Um, even before the 2020 election, uh, the kind of uh, narrative that President Trump uh, tried to use in terms of undermining the legitimacy of what that election was going to represent the uh, kind of notion that there were um, state level conspiracies occurring that were going to uh, steal the vote from him. Um, and then, you know, obviously, uh, as we all know, with great force after the 2020 election occurred, um, you know, claiming that state level voting equipment, state level officials, that there were processes that were not operating with integrity and undermining the very ability of the democracy to function. Um, you know, we saw this come to a head on January 6th, 2021, um, when both the kind of very mundane certification process of electoral votes was, uh, even before the, the kind of violence at the Capitol, was, a, you know, a tense set of, um, of days in negotiating up to that, where there was uncertainty as, as to whether the process of a transition in government between President Trump and, and then President-elect Biden was going to work well and the pressure that was being brought to bear both on uh, Vice President Pence at the time and then uh, other government officials uh, to not fulfill their kind of ministerial obligations to have the transfer of power work the way that it was supposed to. Of course, you know, there's the January 6, 2021 um, rioting and violence that occurred at the Capitol, uh, largely meant to uh, disrupt the electoral process and that kind of transfer of power. Even after that point, the changes that were made in a lot of states uh, with regard to voting processes to make the, the act of voting harder by eliminating early voting days, um, shortening the times at which um, you know, the polls were open, um, limiting the ability to, for people to use absentee voting, lots of other measures that were put in place to basically restrict the vote. 
Um, and I think along with this, uh, perhaps thinking about uh, state level efforts that are meant to curtail free speech protections, right? I think that this rides alongside of some of these uh, uh, democracy, uh, democratic values that, that I'm talking about. So curtailing the abilities of, you know, K through 12 teachers to teach certain subjects in, um, in their schools. Uh, curtailing the ability of academics um, to teach uh, how they would want to teach in their classrooms, um, and in, engaging in a kind of selective history that's being promoted in some uh, states in terms of what uh, you know U.S. history was, um, really erasing a lot of the complexity and challenges that our nation has dealt with in terms of its racial history, xenophobia, and other human and civil rights issues. And finally, and perhaps uh, most um, most, uh, you know, recently we're thinking about the very extended process of electing a speaker to the House of Representatives, um, which went 15 rounds, um, you know, because of a very hard right faction of the Republican Party that wanted to ensure that Speaker McCarthy would, um, you know, bow to their decisions and governance priorities and using a kind of protracted vote process to extract concessions that were going to benefit their policy priorities. And so these are just, uh, you know, a, a relatively, uh, you know, it, it seems like a lot, but there's, it's a few of many examples that could be discussed when we think about the fragility of some of our democratic norms. And they speak directly to this question of whether and how government functions, whether there are limits um, to what government can do in terms of punishing people's human and, and civil rights, uh, having to do with voting, having to do with free speech, having to do with other things, how the government is held accountable, and how we ought to be thinking about this notion of the health of our government. Um, I would suggest that this sense of fragility has been in a near constant state since at least 2015. Um, you know, a, a then candidate Trump making various campaign promises that if fulfilled would kind of completely gut the functioning of government as we have been familiar with it and the checks and balances that had previously existed. Um, and trying uh, openly advocating for the undermining of equal protection guarantees in a number of ways. And, you know, I think one of the, the reasons I describe that as a fragility is because you hope that there are both um, kind of hard, um, hard safeguards, right, that would help keep um, our government functioning on track. And also that there would be individuals within government who or outside of government who would speak up in order to um, quash the ability of these kinds of um, De democracy jeopardizing ideas to gain traction in the public sphere. And I think that that hasn't happened largely because of political opportunism. Um, it in fact has, uh, you know, sped up the erosion of norms and a culture of, um, and, and eroded the ability of, of us to prioritize democratic values and to care for them. And I wanna be clear that this opportunism is not just, you know, we, we can't just lay this at, at, at the feet of a few people, right? It, it, it works on many fronts. We can think about um, cultural conservatives um, who were willing to overlook uh, President Trump's lack of engagement in, in the, the you know, core work of a president for the promise of culturally conservative judges. Uh, fiscal conservatives who did the same in order to get favorable tax reforms or the ability to weaken um, labor movements and increase the power of corporations. Um, conservatives who thought that they could do, you know, support certain uh, democracy eroding um, actions by President Trump and others for the sake of their own careers. Um, and I think also, if we think all the way back to 2015, um, progressives, some of whom believed that Trump would be the weakest candidate to come out in the general election, and were willing to use that as a moment of political opportunism to sometimes support um, support him in the face of other more moderate uh, Republicans um, who had governmental experience, whose policies they did not like, and they thought, well, this is a way to jeopardize the ability of Republicans to win in the general election. And then finally, the, the large group of folks within our country who are either perennially, perennially apathetic about voting or became more so because of their dislike of candidates in various election cycles, right? Um, viewing them as not progressive enough or not, you know, fill in the blank enough to satisfy them and chose to sit out um, from voting. Um, so I think that there's, uh, you know, this political opportunism, you know, led to a huge cost over the Trump presidency, right? We know that some of the bureaucracies of administrative agencies that were within government served as a safeguard to some of his 
most kind of um, destructive impulses while in office. But it was also clear that some of these were only partial safeguards and that many um, democracy protecting norms and practices that had been developed over decades and sometimes centuries were simply going to be ignored by the president and his closest um, advisors. Here, I, you can think of the, the whole discussion that came up maybe four or five years ago about the emoluments clause of the constitution and whether it's okay for the president to be like, uh, you know, engaging in enriching himself at the expense of others by using his power in office. And I wanna be clear here, although President Trump was an extreme uh, example of some of this kind of uh, erosion of democracy, uh, it's important to bear in mind that he was not the only president who has ever subverted norms, um, and he, he will not have been the last, um, and that he's also part of a global context that has been leaning towards authoritarianism and uh, in, in various pockets and, and kind of even favoring authoritarianism um, around the world, right, and that this is part of the larger conversation about his particular rise to power, but also the state of US um, democracy and democratic values. So here I wanna think a little bit about both historical context and kind of our, our uh, and global norms and global um, uh, politics in recent times. So, uh, you know, a historical context that has come up a lot in recent uh, weeks and months has been this discussion of um, pre-Civil War polarization and divide in the United States and, you know, this idea that somehow we are drifting towards this. And certainly the recent conversations about, um, you know, Speaker McCarthy's, uh, the number of votes required for him to, uh, to secure his position, which had not been seen since the 1850s, um, you know, is, is part of that uh, discussion, this kind of conversation that we've been having for, for several years about an us versus them uh, nature of public discourse or a question of the fraying of a shared social understanding or social compact in the United States. I think some of these things are similarities with the 1850s. There's similarities with other times in US history as well. And I just want us to remember that, right? For uh, you know, over 200 years, right? Polarization and some of these conversations have ebbed and flowed in US history. Uh, this was true all the way back to the late 1790s, right? Very soon after uh, the United States was founded, uh, when, for example, you know, a president like John Adams oversaw the enactment of the Alien and Sedition Acts to try to suppress certain voters and curtail free speech rights of, um, of uh, political opponents and of newspapers, um, all in the name of national security and patriotism and the need to defend a new, uh, a vulnerable nation, right? We've, we've heard this rhetoric before. Um, it was true in the 1850s, as we just discussed but in a way there that was far more profound in certain ways than what we're experiencing today. Um, that same sense of polarization and this question of like whether we are truly one nation versus multiple nations uh, or, or multiple cultural groups, uh, you know, certainly was the, the heart of conversation during reconstruction and after that time. Um, it's true in the in the early 20th century with, uh, you know, government favoring for a period of time kind of an uber capitalism that had no regulation or restraint and then switching after <clears throat> the Great Depression with this idea of the federal government taking a much greater role in people's lives to try to help and try to create social programs and social safety nets that were going to assist Americans, right? In each of those eras, you see this question of polarization of a fraying of social, like a social compact, and this question of like whether democratic norms and, and the fragility around them was something that was going to lead the United States to a breaking point. Um, and I wanna suggest that that kind of uh, sense of polarization, although we feel it in perhaps a new context now, is not something that is, is new at all, right? It is, it is there baked into the history of the United States. And I, I stopped right after the Great Depression, but certainly we can think about conflict uh, during the, you know, the Vietnam conflict and the kind of um, conversation about, around polarization then. We can think of Reaganomics and its policies and how it led to a fraying uh, and uh, cultural and economic divides that we're still feeling today. And I think it's really the kind of bombastic style of um, President Trump and the people who came before him, people like maybe Sarah Palin, and then the people who are kind of coming after him in the same vein, who, um, you know, along with the role that, uh, you know, uh, 
our, our conver kind of um, siloed conversations, thanks to social media and other, um, uh, you know, other platforms have created that uh, this is simply the current iteration of a longstanding feature of US politics, US culture and US society. So to me, the better analogy in thinking about the fraying of these democratic norms and, and values is thinking about global politics and thinking about what's been occurring in some other countries at the same time. So I'll just highlight that as, um, as perhaps food for thought as we think about the trajectory of our own democracy right now. So in the last, if we look back 10, 15 years, the elections of various folks in, in countries, um, you know, uh, in liberal democracies around the world that have led towards a, um, that have led with a, a sense of um, strongman authoritarianism. It's, it's a significant number of countries, right? Just as a few examples, we can think of the Turkish government, um, you know, pr uh, now President uh, Erdogan, who was previously prime minister, um, has systematically tried to increase his own power to uh, decrease the ability for checks and government uh, checks and balances on government and on government co corruption, has um, imposed censorship on critics in the media and in, and uh, and elsewhere. And uh, you know we look at examples like Jair Bolsonaro, right, uh, elected in Brazil in 2019, openly discussing political violence against uh, uh, violence against political opponents, against members of the LGBTQ community, against religious and some racial minorities and others. Um, the election of Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, uh, you know, in in 2016, right. Uh, prominently noted for his uh, advocating for the, the extrajudicial killing of drug users and drug dealers. Um, and other examples as well, like the election of um, Prime Minister Narendra Modi in India in 2014, um, promoting, uh, actively promoting the disenfranchisement of religious minorities and ramping up the internal security apparatus in India against journalists and political critics, often leading to the disappearance of people who have criticized the government. Um, these examples suggest in, in large democracies around the world, the bending and distortion of democratic values, often to an extreme um, in certain situations and very often to the detriment of fundamental human and civil rights. But they also suggest some avenues for change. And that brings me to the third point. This is the role of an engaged democracy or an engaged citizenry in a democracy. So here is where we, can, we need to think about things like long-term goals of voting rights, education, and organization. Uh, this is precisely what the league has always been very good at. And so I, what I'm saying here is playing to strengths that, um, uh, that we all know are important. The first thing I want to say here is about organization. Um, I think it's key here to, to realize that uh, organization is a long-term effort. Um, the Republicans uh, party has been very good at organizing on a local, state, and federal level, thinking about legislatures, thinking about judges, um, thinking about uh, lots of different types of elections for a long time. They have put this into motion for at least four decades now uh, to great effect. Um, they, the fruits of that labor are paying off for them and they have paid off in terms of electing people to school boards, electing people to local office and state office, um, electing the people who have the ability to gerrymander maps, electing the people who have been able to create state level restrictions on funding and on, on rights. And uh, they have been very effective, right? And that is not something that, um, to the extent that it's just about political priorities, it's not necessarily uh, you know, something that undermines democracy. But to the extent that it leads to uh, curtailing people's voting rights, that it leads to curtailing the people to be a, a people from uh, accessing um, a good education, right? And having fairness in that education, uh, to the extent that it leads to um, judges who are willing to um, overlook kind of corrupt practices that are occurring in state government, those are things that actually do fray uh, the, the root of a democracy, right? And so these are pieces that long-term, uh, you know, organization is needed for. And here I want to analogize to something that we can see that's been happening recently in response to the Dobbs decision, right, which is uh, the court decision overturning Roe versus Wade. 
um, you see action, a legislative action on this on local, state, and federal levels, right? Promoting uh, uh, laws to be put into place to protect abortion rights, or even you know provide abortion medication in various um, in various contexts. You see court decisions on a state level and some states looking to Im Im embed constitutional protections for abor uh, abortion in their states. And we see a lot of money and organizing power around education and programming to make sure that people understand their rights, the threat to their rights, and what they can do to combat those threats, right? So I think that that in some senses suggests a path forward about democracy, right? And the idea of how we need to organize on multiple levels looking at various levers of power and how it is um, that uh, we, can, we can organize moving forward to try to protect some of these democratic values and norms. Obviously, voting is a key component of this as well. I think that we need to look back over the last you know, 10 to 15 years to consider the various challenges that have occurred to voting um, that uh, we are, that I think undermine this aspect of, um, you know, democratic governance and think about how we need to move forward from here. So think about the Citizens United decision in 2010, right? The kind of flood of money that's come into elect elections at that point. We think about the Shelby County decision in 2013, uh, which is when the Voting Rights Act was gutted by the Supreme Court. Um, the last several years, the Supreme Court has upheld a bunch of these state level um, redistricting um, decisions that were done openly based on the ability for Republicans to gain more seats, occasionally for Democrats as well, depending on the state, right? And the Supreme Court has largely upheld those as not violative of federal constitutional rights. So there's these headwinds, right? And then and again, as I mentioned earlier, after the 2020 uh, uh, national election, when all of these voting uh, rights restrictions came into places in different states. So I think those um, promote a lot of, of uh, or it engendered a lot of fear and concern from people that this was going to lead to the inability for progressives to get elected, an inability for um, people to be able to vote. And I think the response to that has been very instructive, again, in terms of organization, right? The power of get out the vote um, efforts, uh, they have uh, in some senses blunted um, or channeled uh, the, the money that has entered politics, the restrictions that have been in place in various jurisdictions, and some of the misinformation and disinformation that has come up in the election cycles, they've led to, for the ability of people to contest in districts even when literally the map is drawn against them, right? That it is made, made difficult for them to, to be competitive. We've seen some ability there to organize in terms of voting. Um, and the last piece I would suggest is the importance of uh, is fighting for educational rights and free speech rights that come along with that. Um, here, I think it's important for us to think about, uh, you know, a very long term investment and how it is that we protect uh, democratic norms and values through uh, resources for schools, for libraries, um, protection for those at universities in terms of academic freedom and their ability to teach in a way that they are not going to get punished by their state government, which is right, something that is, um, you know, I think a big question mark in states like Florida. And really hear what I want to say with all three of these things, with generally organizing on multiple levels or uh, thinking about the ways in which to um, continue to get people to vote and to vote um, vote thoughtfully even in the face of headwinds and investing in education. Um, and whether that means getting people elected to school boards or in a position to help uh, uh, effectuate the um, better finances for schools, right? These are all things that are playing the long game. And I think that that's the piece that uh, I wanna leave with. Uh, I personally, um, I realize that all of these obstacle, it's, obstacles exist. They are, uh, they are headwinds to be sure. But I tend to be an optimistic person and I'm optimistic about this piece as well. We've seen the ability to turn the tide in other nations, right? The kind of um, uh, notion of, you know, uh, Lula da Silva being elected in Brazil. It gives one hope that even after a hard right government that there can be um, progressives who are elected given the right coalition of voters, education and a real ability to turn out the vote for things. Um, obviously, that's one example among uh, lots of other examples of uh, 
you know, uh, conservative governments uh, and those governments that are trying to undermine um, democratic values still in power in other places. But I think that it suggests a pathway forward for an engaged citizenry to really uh, change the way we think about our own role in democracy and effectuating change both on the local and state level and hopefully moving to the federal level as well. So I feel like uh, I, I claimed to you that I was going to speak for a short amount of time and then I didn't. And so I'm going to wrap it up there and, and hope that we can have a conversation. Sorry, I was struggling to unmute. <laughs> But uh, this was excellent, and I'd like to open it to questions or you know whatever. And you know, um, Marcy Ash, help me make sure I don't miss people. Um, Jeff, I see your hand, and I see Alisa Alisa, Alisa Campbell. So I'm going to call that one and two, and Barbara Pier Pearson. Okay, Jeff, you start us. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, very cogent analysis on many different levels. Um, I, I wonder if you could comment on a couple of uh, on a couple of things that are that is related to what you uh, have been talking about. Um, one is um, that um, when um, there's been a lot of writing about how democracies fail over the recent years for all the obvious reasons. And one, one of the common themes of, of these writers seems to be that, and, and they compare it to, um, uh, uh, you know, Nazi Germany and, the, and, and Hitler is that when, when anti-systems parties get into power, that is a signal of, uh, I think your word is was fraying, um, and it seems to me that one of the differences um, in some of the um, comparisons that you made is um, that um, in, in some of those other instances, like you mentioned Reaganomics and and a few others, you you didn't have an, the Republican Party at that point in time was not an anti-system party. It was a it had a it had a an ideology which was limited government, et cetera, et cetera, but it wasn't an anti-system party. The the Republican government government uh, party now is 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 dominated by anti-system individuals um, and ideology, um, which of course interweaves with um, uh, uh, other. Um, right-wing forces. Um, so I wonder if you could, number one, comment on that. And also, and if I'm taking up too much time, forget this other part. But the other thing that I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on is um, what I would call the politics of resentment. Um, it's not, to me, the politics of grievance that is driving these people, although in the media, it sometimes is called that. I, Krugman recently called it resentment. And I think I think that's a more accurate description. A, a grievance is when somebody has a legitimate, you know, a real, a legitimate gripe, so to speak. Um, uh, this is more resentment and anger, and it seems rather global um, in, in, in nature. And I was just wondering your, your thoughts about that. Thank you. And thank you very much for being here too. No, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, and and your your questions are are really uh, good ones. Um, I, I'll speak, I guess, first to the the anti systems piece, which I, I think is right. I mean, I, I I think that the most vocal voices in the Republican Party are people who are anti systems folks, and I think that there's. Um, a little bit of distortion in the sense that um, there are a lot of people in the Republican Party who are uh, are, are systems oriented people, right? That we, you know, they may disagree with me on, on, and I may disagree with them on questions of policy or whatever else. But you know, if you look at uh, you know the kind of Mitt Romney type politicians, they are certainly systems people, right? You, they're oriented towards that. I think for a lot of reasons, they tend to be quieter than a lot of uh, their, their more vocal um, and bombastic counterparts, but uh, they are getting elected, right? They are getting elected to uh, different um, uh, offices. And so I think, you know, one of the open questions that comes up with the, the weakening of the speaker who is also, uh, you know, he vacillates in what he says, but he is a systems oriented person, um, you know, a, a little bit at his core. 
um, it will will be how much the the anti systems folks are able to hold sway on him, given um, the the weakening of the the speaker's position. Um, and, and again, here, there's uh, a question of, of political opportunism, right? To the extent that the House of Representatives is unable to function effectively, I mean, there are certain things where they have to pull together on like the debt ceiling or whatever else. But, uh, you know, with some of the, the policy priorities that, um, that many of us would find to be distasteful, maybe an inability to govern effectively is precisely what we want from these folks. And, you know, it's, it's kind of analogizing um, uh, to the conversation about whether uh, Ron DeSantis would be a uh, a more dangerous version of Trump because he might believe the same things, but he actually knows how to go, you know, how how to work a, an electoral system in a in a particular way. Um, so I, I agree with you that there has been a rise in in um, in the kind of anti systems folks. I, I don't know that it's necessarily. Um, uh, a, a huge percentage of the Republican Party. And I do think that some of those people who are uh, kind of, um, who were who were in in contests in 2022 did not win their races. And I think that that, um, that signals some at least conflict. I'm not gonna say it was like a win for the systems uh, or oriented among us, but certainly suggests uh, that their rise might not be, um, as as swift or as uniform as we would we would worry about. So uh, I'll say that on on that piece. In terms of the politics of resentment, I think I, I would agree wholeheartedly. But I also would suggest that this too is not uh, not entirely new, right? Um, that this idea of resentment, um, uh, it particularly like if I think about the kind of um, stoking of concerns that, that really rotate around xenophobia, right? This is not anything new in the United States. This has existed right. since the founding of the country. Right. And um, the kind of uh, ability to use that to gin up, um, uh, you know, votes and money for uh, for candidates who um, otherwise are not benefiting one's own, you know, uh, you know, one's own self is, is a longstanding thing in US politics. And so I agree that it exists. I think it is deeply problematic. I do not think it's new. Um, so uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess we can we can discuss more later. I know there are other people in the queue though. Thank okay. you. Um, Elise, is it Alyssa Campbell? Didn't well, you have Alyssa, your thank you. Um, I, I really appreciated what you said. I, found myself nodding my head a lot. Um, I am especially concerned about consistency and persistence and digging in for the long haul, because I completely agree with you that the Republicans, enough Republicans have been doing that for 40 years. That's why we lost Roe versus Wade, why they have the Supreme Court, why they have state legislatures and school committees and stuff like that. And I worry that too many people who I generally agree with don't have staying power. You know, people will say, well, I voted for you last time and you didn't do it. You didn't do anything for me. So I'm going to sit out and, you know, you're going to you need me and I'm going to just sit on my hands. And that doesn't help. I don't know what the I'm not an organizer. I don't know how how one goes around, you know, convincing people that. You have to keep at it. So yeah, I, I think that that's a really interesting observation. And I think, you know, there's been some interesting writing over the last couple of years about how progressive social justice organizations have struggled with this, right? Because there's a kind of um, embattled sense that, uh, you know, there's folks who are, are pushing um, really hard for, for uh, you know, a, a kind of very progressive move. And then um, that the folks who are kind of longer term people who have been engaged in this work for some time, who are talking about compromise and incremental change and a lot of stuff that there's a lot of tension there. So I, 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 um, I hear what you're saying. I think that, that there's um, uh, perhaps going back to the previous comment that was made, right? Like prior to the rise of the anti-systems folks in the, in the Republican party, I think they exhibited a lot more discipline, right? In terms of uh, being able to support candidates, even if they weren't matching up with all of their positions and that, you know, oftentimes progressive politics tend to be messier for lots of reasons. Um, uh, you know, I do think, uh, you know, I, I hope that there is a sense that, um, that sometimes compromise candidates are what you are going to get, and that the um, the 
the problem with sitting out on the sidelines is what happened in 2016, right? That people said, well, either it won't be that, it won't happen, right? Trump won't get elected or what's the difference, right? Because they are viewing, you know, anybody who is not kind of of the very, you know, same um, progressive mindset as, as uh, they are as, as folks who, um, you know, all ought to be, uh, you know, no one should vote for them. And one, one can only hope that there is, again, this piece of education about the, the dangers that are wrought by that, right? The, uh, the Supreme Court, as you mentioned, is one of them. Um, lots of laws and regulations were changed um, under, under the Trump administration. There's so much that could have been different in this country had that election gone differently. And I, uh, I can only hope that people see that and they see that as much as you wanna advocate for something, that there is a strong role for compromise. And you know, I, I used to say this when I lived in Amherst, I guess I can say it even more that, I, that now that I'm in New York, the analogy is that the subway is not always gonna take you exactly to the block that you wanna get to. It gets you close and then you might have to take a bus or walk the rest of the way, right? And so that's how we have to view electoral politics on all levels as well, right? We don't always get the candidate that we love that takes us exactly to the place we wanna go, but it can get you close, right? And that kind of sustained effort is hard. It's hard work and so, um, you know, I, I, I hear your, your concern there, but it, it's, uh, you know, it's something that we need to address, I think, collectively. Okay. Know, well, to me, it's, it's like Humphrey versus Nixon. Think how much better off this country would be if we'd had Humphrey, not Nixon. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, I'm going to ask um, um, Ruth Baskerville and then Barbara and then Gary. Okay, I'm just giving you all an order. Ruth, can you unmute? And, and so, Ruth, unmute. Uh, I, I had not had my hand raised, but I just wanted to say how much I am enjoying this entire conversation, the, the intellectual level and the heart that goes with it. And bless you, our, our guest speaker this evening, for being so succinct and just putting everything in such a crystallized fashion. I very much appreciate it. And I thank you, moderator, Andrea. <laughs> Thank you, Darla. Okay, Barbara. Yes, I um, I echo uh, Ruth Baskerville's uh, feeling about how well, how nicely it was all put together. I'm looking forward to the video so I can go back and hear the story all over again. <laughs> but um, one of the things that strikes me, and I wanted to ask you about your opinion about a source that I find very um, important. And when you were talking about what the Republicans did to get themselves to this place where we are, where they can do at will whatever they want to do, I think we give too much credit to the Republicans because <laughs> did, you, did you read Jane Mayer's Dark Money? Yeah. And are you swayed by Jane Mayer's Dark Money? Because Go ahead. It was that what they have, the system they have, was bought at enormous expense without any trappings of democracy, agreement, majority rule, just whatever the oligarch, the billionaire wanted to do, they figured out, a, they, I mean, talk about persistence, <laughs> but the... Uh, <laughs> As soon as as soon as Nixon, Nixon was a dis disappointment to these guys, right? Mm -hmm. Because he did progressive things. He did OSHA. He did federal, you know, uh, election laws. And as soon as that was in, they were fighting against that. And they were they didn't really go into high gear until Reagan. But these are the people that bankrolled somebody to just throw cases at the Supreme Court till they got Citizens United, yep. right? Anyway, so I just wondered if you had a, an opinion about Jane Mayer's story. Um, so let, let me step back and just say more large, you know, more generally that the role of money in all of this is, as you're pointing out, is, is extraordinary, right? The role of money in 
um, you know, uh, really uh, not just electing people to office, which of course, uh, you know, we talked about a little bit before, but also in influencing, in influencing political decisions on all levels is extremely high, right? Um, the, uh, the role that it plays in lobbying, right, in, um, in trying to, uh, you know, basically buy certain regulations is extraordinarily high. And I mean, we see this playing out in politics on all levels, right? That is a, a, an amount of money that has gone into state level elections and school even local boards. elections is, is, is school remarkable. boards, school boards, right? Mm -hmm. It is, it is bought. And, and so this is, um, this is one of the many, many reasons why this kind of longer term strategizing is so important because, uh, you know, it, it's, um, you know, if you think about political philosophy and this idea that um, any kind of people who are in, in a position of power are going to try to hold on to that power by whatever means they can, right? And uh, it, 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 it's so deeply entrenched that this is not a matter for one election or to say, you know, I voted, you know, as, as one previous person said, I voted for you this one time, you got to get the results or I'm going to walk, right? It is the long game to be persistent and to try to um, to work against these things. And I'm not suggesting that this is easy, right? It's, it is headwinds and, and it's incremental progress that can be made, but getting people to invest in the idea that that progress can actually lead to significant changes, right? In terms of uh, regulation, in terms of uh, protection for, for civil rights, um, again, on local state and federal levels, again, through legislatures and through courts, right? Uh, to think about that as a multifaceted approach mm -hmm. means that you don't just hang your hat on having Roe versus Wade there to protect abortion rights. You're thinking on all levels about how it is to kind of engage people in the work that it takes to protect those rights. Um, and and uh, you, I agree with you 100% um, uh, and Jane Mayer about the corrosive effect of money and that true to, to um, non-transparent money and, and uh, curtailing our ability to do that. But uh, I, I think that um, if you know that the role of that is clear, right, it, it makes clear to you what the challenge is and, and helps kind of craft what that path might look like going forward. Yeah, and as um, some other, well, Michael Moore especially says, we're more, <laughs> there's more of us. <laughs> we just have, you know, and in fact, we got a little sense of that, that yeah. we're waking people up who haven't been participating. And that's what we need. There are mm -hmm. way more of us <laughs> than they are. If Thank only you. they don't take away all the strings. Okay, Gary Tartikoff, unmute, unmute. <laughs> it's more exciting muted. <laughs> I, I'm afraid our conversation for me is a little too technical and maybe too liberal. Uh, liberals get really interested if something hurts them and, and George Floyd hurt desperately and people stood up and, and, and reacted. Uh, we shouldn't be talking about money. We should be talking about capital. Uh, the people with real money have worked real hard, don't stop working to keep their money as much as they can. They're interested in taxes. No matter what Trump did or didn't do, they got their tax break. Mm -hmm. That's and, and that hasn't slowed up. That's consistent. Uh, liberals are interested in good things when they get energized to do it. But uh, we lost a lot of ground after Reagan. The Clintons really, uh, and, and not just them, but they were the symbol, both of them, for that business roundtable. And labor got lost. Labor is the only thing in this country, other than civil rights, that has been consistently looking for development of our democracy. Mm -hmm. When there are lots of labor unions, there's a lot more education. There's a lot more push on lots of levels. Uh, until well, we're at a moment where labor is coming back, and let's hope it comes back strongly. But this is a real ideological fight. the The average Republican doesn't care about civil rights; uh, they're interested in white rights. Uh, that's shame to say, but I mean, you just see who's in Congress, who can run. You know, they are not interested in civil rights, and they're not interested in our democracy. They're interested in keeping their money. You know, uh, we need to strengthen certainly the labor movement. Uh, and, and we need to talk about issues, not just how unfair voting is, but why it's unfair and what they're trying to do about it, right? Whether it's uh, church-oriented people and their direction in terms of, of the abortion law. Uh, they really cared about it and, and liberals really did 
I mean, we cared about it. I, I'm liberal too, but uh, we had to be much more consistent and really strive and work for it. Uh, it's not going to happen easily. Uh, so, so I'll agree with with um, especially that last piece, right? It's not going to happen easily. I think uh, you know my personal view is that most people vote um, aligned with what they believe their interests are, what their priorities are, right? Um, and and I do like uh, you know what the 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 uh, what Barbara said a minute ago. There are there are a lot of people who are interested in you know. Uh, uh, civil rights protections and human rights protections, and there's a lot of people who are also interested in protecting money and protecting uh, uh, protecting their own wealth. Um, and and I think that that's uh, you know I, I would also suggest that a lot of people who um, who uh, you know we have a conversation sometimes in in progressive circles about like oh well I, you know I, I can't believe that that you know uh, poor folks in rural communities are voting against their interests right when they vote for uh, for uh, sometimes vote for Republicans, uh, you know, I, I think that that's not not necessarily true, right? Like if their interests are, if they really genuinely believe in, um, you know, putting anti-abortion, anti-choice judges uh, in power, then maybe they're voting for what's what they believe in, right? So I think it's complicated. It's not just about money for folks, but it's about a lot of things. And um, and I agree that it 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 it's a long game. I mean, uh, you know, capitalism is a really powerful institution. It's the bedrock of our country, and it it uh, incentivizes uh, a protection of of uh, of capital. It incentivizes a protection of uh, the means of generating um, uh, wealth and keeping wealth in certain in certain circles. Um, and you know, that is that is a, a deeply entrenched. Uh, part of, of the uh, American fabric, both cultural and political. And so um, working against that to the benefit um, of individual rights, whether through labor unions or something else, I think is, is as you said, it's, it's hard work and it's long-term work, right? It, requ it requires both the investment of time and energy um, for, for probably decades, right? This is, it's, uh, uh, you know, I think, it, like it, you alluded to George Floyd's killing, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, um, racial racial justice is the work of generations, right? It's not not the work of of two years or five years or anything else. It's it it's a, an investment in in changing the way an entire culture and society works. And we shouldn't kid ourselves that that's something that can be done overnight or with the passage of a couple of laws or resolutions that sound nice. It's it's hard. Long long term, that's been a real success too because people have stuck with it because partly the people who it matters to most have been struggling just to get a fair deal. What I'm thinking of in part is that people, the more wealth you have, the more likely you vote. Uh, Biden, mm -hmm. and in fact, Biden's uh, predecessor, Obama, brought out the black vote in a really such a serious way that the Democratic Party now knows, and not that it's its only vote, but it's a really important vote to them, and blacks are voting in more and more numbers. Uh, but the lower your income, the less likely you are to vote. And I think the Democratic Party has failed, you know, is failing. We are failing. <laughs> I mean, I go out with Barbara and other people to try and get people out. We need to get people with mm -hmm. low incomes to realize that's partly because of our laws, right? The laws have decided who pays taxes and, and where they go. But the poor, let's say, or the underfinanced or the out of, have lost confidence. We, they, the Democratic Party ought to be getting them out to vote. The Democratic Party works for them. We need to get those people to feel like they can do something for themselves because they can. And, and I think there also needs to be a longer term investment in and under, uh, this is my point about educational investment too, to understanding what the role of government is, to understand how it is that you can mm -hmm. impact uh, what it is that government does. And, um, you know, educating people on the importance of things like like civics and rights, you know, basic fundamental things to help people understand to to start making that investment mm -hmm. in in what's important as a society, right? Our our what we do in our educational system reflects what our priorities are as a society, and you know that is being deeply cut and underfunded and 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 distorted, right? If you look at this kind of um, terrible sanitization of uh, sanitizing of American history, right? That's being taught in schools and things, right? There's a, there's a much longer um, longer term investment that has to be made in order to like put the pieces in place. Cause it is again, a, a, a longer term struggle. 
with hopefully some short-term victories peppered in there as well. Well, right now I don't see, so I'm gonna just ask a question. Um, the peaceful trans, you know, I I used I taught AP government as well as um, participation in government, which in New York State is required to graduate. You have to know. Okay. Anyway, um, but one of the things that I told my students, and I've gotten so many responses since um, all of this, one of the main tenets of democracy, of our democracy, is the peaceful transition of power. Okay, that's it. The emoluments is another thing I realized. But, and the idea of upholding the Constitution, which everyone who goes into Congress has to take an oath, I'm trying to understand why someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who obviously is saying things like, if I had been in charge of, of, the, uh, of, of January 6th, it would have succeeded, can continue to take the oath as she did um, and, and continue to be, or people like Getz and, and even Ted Cruz, why nobody is even going, I mean, I'm just saying, our constitution is interesting, but we've never been challenged to this level since, I guess, Andrew, jo um, Andrew Johnson after the uh, Civil War. Um, you know, because how do they go about saying to them, you are advocating the overthrow of our government without peace? And, you know, therefore you cannot serve in Congress. You have gone against your oath. Um, I see nothing in that direction, and that scares me tremendously. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. I think that there, there are folks, um, you know, the folks that you mentioned are people who I think, um, again, this has to do with the political opportunism, right? The idea mm -hmm. that they can gain a lot through um, these kinds of sound bites or whatever else that they are feeding back to their constituents. I have no doubt for each one of them that they uh, use the clips of them saying this in their you know, campaign materials or fundraising materials to show that they're ready to like, you know, be rebels in Congress or whatever else. Um, I think the hard part here is that, uh, well, two things, right? One is that they, they'll claim that, um, you know, if pressed on something, many of them will claim, oh, well, you know, it's it's kind of talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, I was joking or I was just talking about something else or being kind of like bombastic, but it's not real. It's not, you know, so you're not holding them to something under under oath, right? They're just kind of speaking um, uh, in ways that are, are to their own political benefit. And then I think the other part, um, Andrea, that you're talking about is is uh, goes to this question of norms, right? Like we have this norm that people swear an allegiance to uphold the constitution. Um, there's not really much behind that in terms of teeth, right? If we see someone in violation of that as a, as a Congress member, there's no mechanism that's in place to like mm -hmm. sue them or whatever else, right? Like so, some sort of breach of contract or fraud, a fraud upon the government. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's available is, uh, you know, m milder um, things like censure, right? Res resolutions of censure that would be available in Congress. Um, you could impeach someone, right? depending on what state you're in, if it's like a state level governor who can be recalled, right? There's some ability to do that, but there's not good mechanisms to check people who are um, you know, full of like anti-constitutional rhetoric two minutes after you know, swearing an oath of allegiance to the constitution, right? It's, it's a norm and a practice. And I think a sense of decorum that many people would hope that we have in our politicians, but clearly these folks are are, are calculated, right? Um, in terms of knowing what's going to feed their base and help, uh, you know, foster donations or other kinds of support. Yeah, I find it. I I, I totally agree with you. I I don't think there's anything unless someone goes out to do it and they have to really prove it. Right now we have a situation with a person in Congress who has lied about everything in relation to, you know, and and now there's a problem with the money that he raised and whatever, did he raise it? But so he might, they might get him on the money, who knows, you know, it's in, anyway, Ash and then Carol. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for the presentation. It, it was really just so helpful to provide that overview. Uh, one of the areas I think that is, not unique in, in American history, but is at a, at a, at a serious point of, of breaking down our 
democratic values is the problem of truth and the problem of fact. Um, the degree to which uh, Trump uh, kind of modeled this right from the start, uh, I, he had this incredible number of factual errors in his presentations, I, far beyond any other leader has ever had. But, but also the, the case of this, uh, this representative from New York who, who had a totally false CV and is, no, none of the other Republicans have said much about that. <laughs> and in other words, the acceptance of misinformation and, and, and distortion of truth. Um, I, I just read something like 70% of the Republicans still believe that what happened on January 6th was a protest instead of an insurrection. It was an insurrection because it was aimed to overthrow the process of the transfer of power very clearly. I mean, as fact, and yet, and, and what democracy really requires that there is at least an agreement about basic mm -hmm. fact, because that's how you have to begin the dialogue about what to do about it. But if you don't agree on it, you're in trouble. So in that sense, wouldn't you say that at this point in time, our democracy is very fragile because of the failure of um, addressing the, the, the question of fact and truth and in public discourse. Yeah, I, I think that that's all fair, right? Uh, George Santos is, is really just one example um, among many, right, of this kind of um, set of falsehoods that uh, that people they'll use. I mean, he's a very extreme example, right? Most people aren't lying that they like, you know, went to college or whatever else, right? <laughs> <laughs> running for office. Um, so he is a, a really extreme example. But I, I think you're. I, I think two things, right? One is yes, there is kind of an extreme um, sense that there's no repercussions for lying, or there are very few repercussions for lying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was thinking uh, back to the fact that you know when Paul Ryan was a um, vice presidential candidate, that was only ten years ago, eleven years ago. Um, people were. Um, lambasting the fact that he had like lied on like a half marathon time or something like that, that he had run, right like it was a huge scandal that he had like you know made himself out to be you know more fit than he actually was or whatever and boy weren't that wasn't that a quaint thing to be like outraged about at the time right given the state of affairs that we're at now so I do think there is to that uh, that and and you know the commentator in the, in the chat I think is exactly right that social media has been a big part of that and the kind of lack of gatekeeping mechanisms the um the um, undermining of uh, local and regional news I think is also something to be thinking about here right that uh, there's not good resources to for the people to go to um, school board meetings and, and have good reporting on it or go to local council city council meetings and have good uh, fact checkers and reporters in place. Um, so there's many aspects of how this has undermined um, the ability for some sort of, uh, of truth and, and a great deal of skepticism about the, uh, about the idea of gatekeeping at all right. Um, if we remember uh, when. Um, you know, as, as an analogous example, uh, when when people started self-publishing novels, uh, you know, on a regular basis, being this is great. We don't need uh, you know uh, editors to tell us uh, uh, you know what's good and what's not anymore. Well, uh, sure, <laughs> then you have a lot of stuff out there where you're like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you question the quality and integrity of what's being written. So um, I agree with that. I don't think it's necessarily the case. Um, that uh, that this is entirely new. I think that part again, part of the educational process for ourselves at whatever age we're at and whatever stage of life has to be to consider what is um, what is a reliable uh, news source and what is also um, allowing ourselves to hear dissenting voices. And I mean this for frankly anywhere that anyone is on the political spectrum, right? Like that's really important uh, to work against the algorithms and social media to work against you know kind of uh, you know, whatever is fed or suggested to you to read things that sometimes make us uncomfortable, to make us uh, think twice about our positions and make us uh, understand what other people's perspectives are. I think that is kind of a responsibility we ought to take on um, in terms of educating ourselves. And, uh, you know, those of us who are, 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 you know, like Andrea, like myself, other people who have been or are currently in the role of being educated, like formally educators as our job, like this is part of what we need to do, right, to kind of 
uh, inculcate these values that it's important to read broadly and widely and reliably in order to um, educate oneself about, about the world. Um, I think it's also fair to say that um, this is not only to blame on social media. I think that um, prior to the rise of this and prior to the rise of these kinds of lies and falsehoods, there were still false information being given about candidates and about uh, policies and whatever else. It was just done through different means that might have been a little bit more costly or a little slower. Um, but that exists that pre that predates kind of the current cycle that we're seeing. And so, the things that we use in terms of conversation to try to educate those around us, formal education, reading broadly and, re and from reliable sources, those are things that, uh, you know, I, I, it was good advice 20 years ago and it's really good advice now yeah. and important advice now. Um, Carol. Hi, thank you so much for um, hosting this event and I appreciate all the information that I've learned. I'm here in uh, Central Florida and I can tell you boots on ground is entirely different flavor under Governor DeSantis. Just today in the news, we learned that the library librarians have been forewarned to tread lightly in choosing books. We already know that we, all, we have various laws, anti-woke, anti-protest, anti-everything. So I'm not as optimistic as uh, I hear other people are speaking because the evangelicals literally have decided that they're going to use their members as soldiers in this radical idea of their democracy. And I just wanted you to speak on what the role of church is. It's supposed to be separate from state, but it is anything but separate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And, um, you know, uh, I think it's a much larger conversation um, to discuss how it is that, um, you know, whether it is that churches uh, or any religious organization that really engages in like a, a significant amount of political advocacy work, um, whether that ought to be, you know, a loss of tax exempt status, whether there ought to be other repercussions that come with it, which would very quickly curtail the activities of those organizations, right? Um, so I do think that there, there are some possibilities of foot for that. I mean, I hear what you're saying, right? The political landscape in Massachusetts or New York is a very different one than, than in Florida or in uh, Texas or in a lot of other states. Um, I do think there too, there is uh, there's a role for, for long-term voting organization and, and, and uh, voting and organization, long-term investments and, and how we educate. And I think here too, uh, there is a role for creative thinking about how to manage that environment. I mean, I was very pleased to see that like, um, you know, uh, uh, the Brooklyn Queens and New York Public Library basically made virtual access free for every person, you know, every person in the country, you can become a member and read whatever you want to that are, is on the shelves, right? Like that is a wonderful thing. I know a lot of other jurisdictions have done things like this because um, you know, repressive practices in terms of what librarians are able to, to buy and store, uh, you know, put on their shelves. Um, again, not new, but certainly uh, 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 not a good sign in terms of this notion of how we should be educating our populace. Um, I think the other thing uh, to think about here is the fact that we can, um, we can think about, uh, you know, what it means to, uh, to have something occur in a state versus a federal level, right? Uh, the restriction, and, and to think about the economic piece of it too. So two things here, right? One would be, um, you know, certain things that are being done in states would be considered, um, you know, they're okay for the state that, that they're in, they're, they're uh, within the law, and other things are unconstitutional, but either on a state level or a federal level, and would be, we shot down elsewhere. So to the extent that, uh, you know, a Governor DeSantis um, thinks that he can export a lot of the things that he's doing to the national level, like that's that's political talk that wouldn't necessarily fly, right? Um, the second piece, I think, is the economic one. I think that we have seen effectively in other places, um, if we think back over the last 10 years, 
of uh, boycotts to certain states where large organizations will not hold conferences or not, you know, hold an NCAA tournament or whatever else in states that are trying to um, put into place really regressive um, uh, uh, rules in terms of who can use what bathroom and whether it aligns with the gender identity or not, or things like that. I know that in the world of law schools, right, um, when people are making con uh, contracts for conferences for the next five years, there's a, nobody's doing it in Florida, right? They're they're saying that we are not going to do this anymore, and so there's pressure to be bought, brought to bear on on uh, on money, right? That can actually be beneficial here, right? On companies and whatever else to say no, we are not going to. Um, uh, you know, host our events here. We're not going to uh, send people here. And and I think that there, you know, Florida has already seen some repercussions in that, right? The number of people who um, are uh, part of the University of Florida system or Florida State who are trying to look for work elsewhere because they are worried about what's coming down the pike is serious. Mm -hmm. um, well, will that actually affect politics in the next four years? I don't know, but there are repercussions that are going to hit the state. And, you know, it may be the case that, um, that again, longer term, th there is some impact on that. Um, I guess I should just finish by saying thank you for sharing your report. And I'm sorry that that's what you're doing. <laughs> okay. Um, I would just like to um, thank you so much. Um, uh, Suda Seti for your uh, sort of set, uh, for your 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 commentary, but I mean, you know, your you, what you explained was so clear, and um, you know, I have hope, um, especially after the last election where most of the deniers of the election lost, um, and so that says something about the movement, and I'm very afraid of what's about to happen. Um, I, I really don't know if people understand what these people are about to do to hold them hostage because they're not people who think that they're that, you know, they don't think rationally in terms of what their job is as a congressperson or whatever. So we have to keep on our toes and, and the League of Women Voters are really going to have to be on our toes and pushing people to go and vote all over the United States because we need rational people voting because this is really, really dangerous. And, you know, I'll tell you, they can mess with Medicare and Social Security, but they will be in trouble, um, you know, because I'll be on a bus too in a minute, you know, because it's ridiculous. <laughs> you, know, you know, this is, they call it an entitlement. I resent it. I paid that mess, you know, <laughs> like, and so, you know, it, 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 it could get ugly because people don't realize this is serious, the, the debt ceiling. And Yellen is saying it because by June, we could be in serious trouble. And I don't want to see people who work their whole lives lose their 401ks or lose a lot of whatever and lose Social Security and stuff. This is crazy. And 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 these are what these some of these people are, crazy. So I think that our system may be okay because, like I said, I got a little bit better with the last election and uh, maybe we have a chance. Maybe we have a chance because people may vote them out. And, it, you know, it could be we could end up with one party. Now we need at least two. So let, let's hope we can form another party. Somebody can, you know, and, and, and <laughs> it's not about the progressives. Anyway, thank you so much. And before we end, please know that our, our next and thank, thank you, everybody, please, you know, just the little clap <laughs> because this was even four times better. We thought it was going to be great. It was incredible. <laughs> and um, next month, um, uh, December 14th, um, Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste, and yes, she has the same part of her February. Name. February. February. Oh, February 14th, Valentine's Day, is going to be speaking uh, on um, Rebecca. What's, what was the title? <laughs> Um, that uh, she's going to be talking because we're doing February because of W.B. Du Bois. Uh, it's his birthday, actually the 23rd, but they have an event. So she's doing it the week before. And she's going to talk about, I'm just trying to remember. Okay, Rebecca. it's oh. it's okay. balancing data and democracy, the restorative work of W.E.B. Du Bois and the importance in this moment. Yeah. It's going to be very interesting because we were reading uh, Martin Luther King wrote something and we read it at the, the town on uh, Sunday and people were saying, 
did he come back and just write this last week? And we were like, no. And that's what we say all the time when we're reading Du Bois' work that was written in 1923. Is this still happening? Okay, so it's going to be interesting. And in March 14th also, we're having um, the our new DEI director, Pamela Young, and her assistant, Jennifer Moyston, are going to talk to us. So we have an exciting couple of months coming up, and it's just going to get better. We have some young people who may be talking to us in the spring, and we just haven't finalized everything. Um, so, you know, who are working for climate and social justice and, you know, et cetera. So just keep keep watching and keep looking at our um, things. And before I go, and I'm gonna let Marcy tell, talk about one thing, but please, when you go to leave, there's a survey that comes up. Please mark the survey because then our league, our, our state and national league knows we're doing something. And this is one of the best groups we've had in a long time. And we thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> Marcy? Um, thank you, Andrea. Just real quickly, for the folks who are uh, Amherst League members, um, I want to invite you on February 23rd at 7 p.m., there will be a programming meeting uh, to talk about the priorities for the, our local league in the next year. And one of the things that we want, the, the Racial Justice Committee wants to um, bring to the table is a study, a league study on reparations. This is something that has not been studied in any league on, uh, on any local, state, or national level in the whole country. And we are really interested in, um, in seeing if we can get that going with our own league, but more importantly, through the state. So um, that and other things, please come to the programming meeting. It will be on Zoom and you'll find information on the league website. And uh, yeah, please do the survey and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate Wonderful. it. Wonderful. Soda, you're awesome. And, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Everyone. What an education. <laughs>